No, it's no, all no. good here. Okay. So let's formally start. Lorenzo, thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, we'll uh, really thrilled to have you here. I'll formally introduce you. And I was uh, trying to find um, all the information about you, but then I found your, your lab site and it's an amazing site. So <laughs> I'll, I'll just uh, read a little bit of parts of your biography there, which is huge. And uh, just in order to the students know uh, how lucky they are that they have uh, like a full hour and a half with you uh, in this small uh, committee here. So um, Lorenzo is currently a assistant professor of cell biology in radiation oncology with the Department of Radiation Oncology in Vio Cornell Medical College in New York. He's also honorary assistant prof, uh, professor adjunct with the Department of Dermatology of the Yale School of Medicine, assistant professor of cell and developmental biology with the Graduate School of Medical Sciences of the Vio Cornell Medical College, as well as faculty member with Graduate School of Bi Biomedical Sciences and Biotechnology of the University of Ferra Ferrara, the Graduate School of Pharmacological Sciences of the University of Padova, and the Graduate School of Network Oncology and Precision Medicine at the University of Roma, Lava Sapienza. Um, his uh, postdoc training at the Gustave Roussy Comprehensive Cancer Center in France, and his PhD is from University of Paris Sud, also in France. He's also Associate Director of the European Academy of Tumor Immunology and founding member of the European Research Institute for Integrated Cellular Pathology. Uh, he's very well known for uh, his uh, contributions to the field of cell death, autophagy, tumor metabolism, tumor immunology. Uh, he has published more than 500 scientific articles in international peer uh, reviewed journals. He's very highly cited. He was uh, nominated by Clarivate Analytics as a highly cited research in 2016, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 as well. Um, he currently is the editor in chief for of four uh, different journals Oncology Immunology, Oncoimmunology, sorry. International Review of Cell Molecular Biology, Methods in Cell Biology and Molecular <laughs> Cell Oncology. Uh, so, you know, lots of stuff about uh, uh, him. Just to give you an idea of how, how great uh, Lorenzo is, how lucky we are of having you here, Lorenzo. So thank you again for being here and, you know, it's the stage you're, um, let's go ahead. All right, thank you. Can you hear me guys well? Yes, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, you let me know if you see what you're supposed to see. And I, I'm going to uh, apologize up front because I'm stuck home. And most likely, the big golden retriever that is sitting in, in my back is going to take an active part of the talk at some stage. And let's see how disrupted this is going to become uh, with, the, with the time. All right. <clears throat> So uh, Gustavo asked me to give you some sort of uh, perspective about um, the immunogenicity of cell death. This is something that is very dear to me. I've been working on this for quite a long time now. And uh, this started, uh, as, as uh, Ricardo mentioned, this started a long time ago in the mid-2000s when I was still a postdoc uh, in the lab of Guido Kromer in Paris when this, this was much less of a... Uh, of uh, a given um, concept than it is now. And I can tell you, we had a hard time convincing some of the editors that uh, apoptosis can be immunogenic. <clears throat> so these are my disclosure. Um, I am operating in various capacity for all of these companies that you see listed on the right here, but uh, uh, nothing that I am discussing today originates from any of this collaboration. And yes, uh, this is the younger version of the thing that is sitting uh, in my back now. All right, let's, uh, let's think about cells and uh, let's think about cells when they are faced with stressful condition, uh, such when I receive this kind of messages from my boss. Um, obviously this generates some sort of, of panic and, and, and then I'm trying to find a way 
to survive and adapt to these kind of scenarios. And, and cells are doing pretty much the same when they receive a, a change in, in their homeostasis, when they're faced with novel uh, environmental conditions, um, they are, first of all, trying to adapt. And if they get lucky and they find substrate that might support this kind of adaptation, uh, they will recover homeostasis and they will keep doing what they were doing before. Cells are pretty much uh, great at that. There are several mechanisms. You've probably heard some, many of them, uh, DNA damage response, uh, yeah, stress response. So there's probably uh, one of them for each of the subsoil compartment we can name. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're good. If stress is uh, not too prolonged in time, if stress is not too harsh, uh, cells can cope with it. They can repair DNA damage. They can uh, recover reticular homeostasis and pretty much uh, be unharmed um, by the changes in the microenvironment. However, uh, when this is not possible and they are not able to cope with stress, um, uh, mammalian cells are uh, provided with uh, a genetic mechanism that uh, um, ensure their terminal fate. And this terminal fate we know now can take uh, to at least two different uh, um, ways, two different paths. One is called cellular senescence, and we are not going to talk about it uh, in the rest of the talk. Um, uh, and the other one, we called it regulated cell death or programmed cell death. I mean, there's a, few, there's a fine difference between these two terms. Some people, they use them as strict synonyms. We tend to differentiate between them, but it basically uh, tells you that this is something that the cells are, are provided with endogenously. So. What is regulated cell death? Regulated cell death is a form of cell death that is controlled by a machinery, uh, a machinery that is genetically encoded, a machinery that hence can be modulated. Uh, sometimes it can be modulated with pharmacological inhibitors, so drugs that are specific to inhibit or activate this machinery. Um, sometimes this is not possible because we are, we are good at generating drugs, but not as good as we want. But obviously, this is always possible from a genetic perspective. So you can always delete a gene that codes for a component of that machinery. We call it regulated as a big uh, like, uh, example, a big group. And within that group, uh, we use the term programmed cell death. And programmed cell death is a type of regulated cell death that is completely physiological, meaning that there's no stress in that case. Simply the cells know that they should die at some stage uh, for physiological purposes. For instance, during embryonic development. As you probably know, um, there are waves of cell death during embryonic development, and these are very important for morphogenesis. For instance, um, cell death in the embryo shapes um, your fingers basically by killing the, the cells that are uh, sitting in the, in, the, in the interdigital space. And this is not a stress response. This is just eukaryotic cells knowing that they have to do what they have to do to generate an organism. And other instances of uh, programmed cell death happen during adult homeostasis. For instance, your intestines are continually changing and are continually renovating. Uh, and that is also something that is completely physiological. Um, we, so we use this big term of regulated cell death to, to contrast it with another form of cell death that is much, much less frequent in human pathology and in human disease, which is called accidental cell death. And accidental cell death just means that the cells cannot do anything to that. There's no adaptation to stress. There's no attempted adaptation to stress. It's just as in you put a torch on top of, you, of your cells and they burn immediately. It, it refers to the uncontrollable uh, disassembly of cells. Cells need to be intact to be alive, obviously. And if you put a bomb in a plate, they will just disintegrate immediately. And there's no genetic modification. There's no pharmacological inhibitor that can change that. And again, in human pathophysiology, accidental cell death is pretty rare. Most of the time, we are talking about regulated cell death. So taking one step back, and this, is, this seems pretty trivial, probably, and, and, and surely it is for Gustavo, but um, it's been a pain over the year to define uh, that when a cell is dead. That's it's a bit a bit like in medicine, right? And then there's this group of doctors around a, a, a dead body, and when the body is dead, and there's few in medicine, they develop lots of criteria, and and in the cell death field, we had to find also um, criteria that are uh, I think they speak to the essence of uh, cell death itself, which is the irreversibility. So we surely know that a cell is not dead if they can go back and become functional again, right? Um, so when do we put the bar 
that we are sure that there's no coming back. And this point of no return has really been a pain to identify. And I think we still disagree on where the point of no return is. So to be sure, we put the bar downstream of that point. We put the bar at a time where there's no coming back at, in all cases, which is when the plasma membrane is sufficiently broken that it cannot be patched up anymore. And most likely the cells were dead before that. I mean, Andreas Strasser was just giving you a talk and he probably alluded to that. The, the, the irreversibility of the process comes before we know that. But since we don't agree where, we just took a very, very cautious and conservative approach. And we said, okay, let's call a dead cells when the cell is broken irreversibly. And there's multiple ways to test it. We can discuss some of them later. It's obviously easier when you test uh, cell death uh, in vitro as compared to when you go in, 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 uh, in animals and in, in, uh, in vivo models. So, and, and this, these slides that I put here, they're a bit stupid, I believe, but they, they also tell you what kind of problems we are facing when we study cell death, what kind of problem we are facing where somebody else studies cell death and they think they know what they're talking about, but sometimes they really don't. So I told you that when a cell has the plasma membrane intact, we still call it alive. It can be probably dying. Perhaps it's even in, downstream of this irreversibility I talked to you about. But for pragmatic purpose, it's a living cell. When the cell has, has the plasma membrane that is broken, it's a dead cell, as I mentioned before, right? There are several phenomena that classically have been associated with di dying cells. One of that is caspase activation, right? Caspase is as a family of proteases that are involved in apoptosis. Um, uh, in this program, so that pathway that we call apoptosis. And yeah, you can observe a dead cells that also has manifested caspase activation. Another process that has been often associated with dead cells is autophagy. And indeed, you can observe dead cells that also manifests signs of autophagy activation. So when, when does the problem start here? The problem starts that people have used caspase activation and autophagy and other phenomena as means to determine if a cell was dead or alive. So there's a few problems of that. First of all, is that we can find living cells that also manifest caspase activation and autophagy. And that's, that's at this time, we just know that we are observing two things at the same time. We observe living cells in caspase activation. We observe living cells and autophagy. And on the other side, we observe dead cells and caspase activation or dead cells and autophagy. So are these things somehow related? Probably. I mean, when you, you, know, when you see things, two things at the same time, your, your mind is set to generate a, a causal, a cause-to-effect relationship, right? And if you think about cause-effect relationship here, one example could be this one. So these cells on the left is alive despite caspase activation, and the one on the right is dead thanks to caspase activation, that is a form of causality. Or it could also be that the cells are alive despite autophagy and that they are dead thanks to autophagy. This is obviously one possibility. But there's another possibility that a priori is equally probable, which is this one. So that the cells here are alive thanks to caspase activation and that despite caspase activation, or they're alive thanks to autophagy and that despite autophagy. <clears throat> and this problem here revolves around one big mistake that in the past was difficult to address. Now it's a bit easier to address, which is called mixing up correlation versus causation. If two things come together, they, this does not necessarily mean that one is responsible for the other. This is something that you can download from like a funny website where they put number together. And apparently the number of films where Nicolas Cage starred in from 1999 to 2009 perfectly correlates with the number of people who drown by falling into a pool. Now you, you can think Nicolas Cage is a bad actor or a good actor, but probably you would agree that the number of movies in which he starred in has nothing to do with the number of people drown, uh, who drowned by falling into a pool, right? So how do you discriminate because cor between correlation and causation? So you do mechanistic studies. 
And mechanistic studies in the past were not available because we did not have the drugs, we did not have the genetic tools, we did not have the capacity, we didn't understood, we didn't understand these pathways as we do today. Now we do. <clears throat> so we know that autophagy, for instance, is built on several genes <clears throat> that code for proteins that mediate this process. And, and we know caspases and we, we know many other players in the cell death scenario. So we can inhibit them. And now we can stress ourselves and ask the question, what happens to a stressed cell if I inhibit autophagy? If my hypothesis is that autophagy is responsible for cell death, I can test it. I can just take autophagy out of the game, still provide a stress to my cells, and then check if they're dying less or they're dying more. So if autophagy were to be actually involved in the killing of cells by a specific stress, let's assume DNA damage or any stress you want. So if you inhibit autophagy, you provide a source of DNA damage, your prediction is that you will find alive cells because you block the mechanisms through which these cells were killed. Actually, in the specific case of autophagy, it turns out that when you block autophagy, you have more dead cells. Um, why? Because the autophagy turns out to be a cytoprotective mechanism, and we're coming back to that later, okay? Um, <clears throat> so going back to this definition of cell death as uh, cells that lose plasma membrane integrity, and we can debate how complicated it is to measure it in, vi in vivo because of cells that then get picked up by phagocytes, but let's stick to in vitro. And one of the main um, assays that have been used so far to measure cell death and this appears in, I don't know, a many figure 1A of a nature paper that has nothing to do with cell death, but they just start by saying, oh, my drug killed my cells, right? And, and this is the measurement of intracellular ATP. So you have cells that are control cells, they grow, they contain ATP, they are happy, and you have a 100% or whatever um, these bars are about. Yeah, persons of, persons of control. So yes, uh, you have this blue curve that tells you that basically nothing is happening because all of the cells have the same amount of ATP that the control, um, that, that, that the control condition. And, and this is, at that time, is still something I accept. Um, also, I accept that when you go to the green line or the purple line in this uh, minus six uh, molar zone, there's nothing. There's no ATP in your cells. So I also accept that here, all of your cells are dead. The problem comes when you want to do something in between, because when you do something in between, for instance, if you take a look at this red curve here in the minus eight zone, uh, that you have this square that is sitting at 70% of control, right? So now you have a condition where the cells, where your cell culture contains 70% of ATP as compared to control condition. So these people interpreted that 30% of the cells were dead, okay? And this is one possible interpretation. I could interpret that none of the cells were dead, but each of them contained 70% ATP than the control cells. So these people here are assuming that their, their intermediate value of ATP, that the value of ATP inside the cell is not changing. So the only possibility is that a cell is dead or not dead and that you remove that from the culture mix. But this is not true. ATP fluctuates, actually ATP, ATP fluctuates a lot in a cell, especially when you mess up with mitochondria, as many cell death stimuli do even before killing a cell. So that's why when you measure cell death, especially in plates, you should just stick to the, per, the percentage of cells that manifest plasma membrane permeabilization. And this is also what I said about autophagy. You can still find textbooks that tell you that there's a type of cell death that, he called, that is called autophagic cell death, and it manifests with this morphological, with these features, morphological feature or lack of biochemical, biochemical features. And for, it, for the field, this is still a major issue. We're still fighting against this because to the best of my knowledge, there are cell death types that are connected to the molecular machinery for autophagy. I think there's beautiful data from uh, Andy Torborn at Colorado University linking the autophagosome as a platform for necroptosis activation. But still, I haven't seen 
a type of cell death that is mechanistically driven by autophagic degradation of substrates. The components, yes, the machinery, yes, but not the process, the process as a you know recycling process. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe somebody would prove me wrong, but so far I haven't seen it. Okay, so what is autophagy? And uh, I will introduce it because there's gonna be a part of the talk about that, right? Autophagy is a mechanism through which the cells take out their trash. Cells generate a lot of trash. They have several mechanisms to take it out. And one is autophagy and autophagy is the trash for the big things. Trash for protein is called proteasome. It's easy, that gets degraded. So simple, no problem. Autophagy takes care of big chunk of cytoplasmic stuff. For instance, permeabilized mitochondria. If you have a cell that gets some mitochondrial issue, the cell will be able to isolate that part of the mitochondrial network and autophagy will come around, will pick it up and send it to lysosomes as a way to get rid of that. Why? Because you don't want to have trash in your house and cells don't want to have trash in their cytoplasm. Um, mitochondrial, when they are permeabilized, they are a source of reactive oxygen species that potentially are genotoxic and they are a problem in general. They can generate inflammatory signals. This can be important or not, depending on the situation you are. But normally cells don't like it, right? So they try to get rid of that by using autophagy. So autophagy takes care of the, cyto of the cytosolic trash through lysosomal degradation. In mammalian system, with a very few exception, as I mentioned before, when you take autophagy out because you delete one of these genes that are mentioned here, ATG5, ATG7, Becklin, all of them, or you block lysosomal degradation at large. There's a chemical you can use for that. One is called bafilomycin, another is called hydroxychloroquine. You can block autophagy, specifically or not specifically. When you do that, your cells are dying more when they're stressed. So autophagy is there when the cells are dying, yes, but it's there as an adaptive mechanism that fails. So in that case, cells are dying despite autophagy activation, not thanks to autophagy activation. And we, this is just an, uh, uh, a reference to what I bang my head against the wall every three to four years. Um, it's the kind of painful stuff that you don't wanna do too often uh, because it involves too many people and getting together uh, on the same lines is complicated. But I think it's a useful it's a useful resource for the field to check um, what we are using as nomenclature for these cell death types that I'm going to introduce right now, and and why it is important to stick to this nomenclature to avoid confusion, which we don't need in this field. There's already enough confusion um, as we speak. So let's take a let, let's take a little bit of a step back. Um, so. As any process, right, you can measure different things when it comes to cell death. You can measure morphology, so you can have a look at the microscope. And this is obviously what has been done first in the 60s, in the 70s. We didn't have a lot of biochemical tools. We started to develop them back in the days. There was no DNA sequence for the entire uh, human genome. Um, so we had to rely on microscopy, basically. And there has been a, a morphological description of cell death. Um, then came biochemistry and we started to observe processes that are measurable. I mentioned earlier caspase activation. Now there's way, many more. There's uh, phosphorylation of uh, MLKL. There's uh, other uh, biochemical features that you can measure by immunoblotting, by immunofluorescence, by specific probes. Uh, this takes away a little bit of the subjectivity. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, and, and it's another dimension, right? And then there's outcome. You know, yeah, we study cell deaths. We study cell deaths sometimes in, in petri dishes, but at the end of the day, cells are not dying in a petri dish when it comes to the real deal. They are dying within an organism. So what does this mean for the organism that the cell is dying? What is the organism doing about it? Because the organism cannot just become a, a big trash of that cells. The organism has to take care of that in a way or another. And that's what I call your outcome. I don't even know, it, probably there's a better word than that. But the idea is that we have been taught from textbooks since the 70s that these three things were, were always moving the same way together. So apoptotic cell death with a specific morphology would always be associated with caspase activation, would all, always be 
silent to the organism. Now we know this is not true. These three parameters can vary independently from each other. So you can have a caspase dependent cell death that, that doesn't have an apoptotic morphology and is inflammatory, okay? So morphology, yeah, we started with that, I told you. <clears throat> we, we had microscope, that's the only thing we could do about it. So we started looking there and we figure out some features that, yeah, are kind of distinctive. I, I agree with that. Look, I mean, if you look at your left side of the screen as compared to the right side of the screen, you see very nicely all this cellular condensation here that is accompanied by nuclear shrinkage and this carrier axis here. So the, the, the patching of the chromatin inside the nuclear, and you see all this blebbing, uh, these apoptotic bodies around here. here. You see another nicely condensed cells. On the right, you see this sort of exploded thing that are ne what was defined necrosis, right? And here, here you barely see it, but there is an exploded cell also down there. So this is all beautiful, but there's two problems. Um, well, there's one problem. If I show you this and I give you a hundred pictures, you're gonna be able to put one cell in a category and another cell in another category very quickly. Now we even have artificial intelligence that can do it for us. The problem is that this is not zero one, this is a spectrum of phenotypes. So sometimes you have cells that have a very, <clears throat> very expanded cytoplasm like a necrotic cells, but they have very condensed nuclei. So where, where are you gonna put that cells? Is this apoptosis or necrosis? So since there's this spectrum, it is difficult and probably operator dependent to classify cell death based on, 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 on uh, morphology. So uh, starting in the late 2000, we got out of there. We, we said, you know, guys, this is too complicated, too potentially prone to a mistake. Let's find something else. So we moved to biochemistry. <clears throat> also because our knowledge about the biochemistry of cell death had improved. And this is very outdated. There is, <laughs> I mean, I should probably change this at some stage, probably write another review to put this in a better scenario. But um, now we have mechanisms that we can interrogate and those are measurable because we have machines that measure them for us. We don't, we don't need to count visually how many cells look like one way or the other way. No, we go to a flow cytometer, we go to an automated microscope, we go to a fluorescence reader, we go to a bioluminescence reader, any type of assay you can think about. They measure one of these things and then you can cut it down and say, okay, I want to measure cell death. I want to see if that thing depends on caspase 9. So I delete caspase 9. I use a caspase inhibitor. Those are bad, don't do it. But anyway, um, you, you block it. And then you go back to your gold standard definition of cell death, which is cells with a per permeabilized membrane. And now you have a good biochemically reproducible thing that probably you can send me your condition and I can do in my lab and the results would be at least comparable, which is not the case on the counting of cells with a specific morphology. <laughs> Sorry. And now based on this, now we have a lot of different cell types, cell death types, <clears throat> each of which is defined biochemically in one or another way, each of which can be interrogated by blocking one pathway, by using an inhibitor, by using a, by using a genetic approach for the ability of cells to be at least partially resistant to cell death. And, and keep that in mind about the thing to be partially resistant because later we're gonna rediscuss that a bit more. <clears throat> so there's also, problems that we have had uh, until now. And I think now this is becoming a little bit clearer. At least for a while, we were all operating in the framework um, that you see in A and B, a framework where all these all this cell death pathways that I mentioned <clears throat> would operate independent from each other. Meaning that a specific lethal trigger here would drive this specific type of ma ma machinery and uh, driving regulated cell death. Another trigger <clears throat> would drive another type of machinery that would drive cell death. A third trigger, third type of machinery, cell death. If this were to be the model, <clears throat> then we would end up in a scenario where we can <clears throat> specifically target one of the machinery, so specifically delay cell death as called by this trigger here, 
<clears throat> while leaving the system untouched for the other two triggers. Unfortunately, or fortunately, probably from a uh, evolutionary perspective, this is not the case. Cell death machinery work this way. They are interconnected, they have backups, they have they communicate to each other. So when you have a specific lethal trigger, it's multiple, I wouldn't say all of them because that's to be demonstrated, but multiple cell death machinery will be engaged directly or indirectly to ultimately promote or uh, I would say accompany cell death. Meaning that if you specifically target one, <clears throat> most of the time you will see an inhibit a, a delay in cell death. You will see a change in some of the features. Of course, you will see if you block caspases, you will see no caspase activation. You will probably see a differential immunological outcome if you do the right thing. But at the end of the day, the cells will die anyway. <clears throat> if <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> if they had gone through this point of no return that I mentioned before. So now we are more prone to accept this kind of framework where there is a, a very robust interconnectivity of the cell death machineries that obviously generates lots of issues when it comes to modulate them from a pharmacological or genetic perspective. So let's go back to this. And I think this is probably the most important part of the talk. Um, so I told you earlier that basically when your cells are faced to some sort of stress, here I called it mild homeostatic perturbation because I wanted to use big words, but you can call it stress. They are trying to survive, okay? And yes, from a pharmacological perspective, at the level of the cell itself, so the cell that is experiencing stress, the cell that is experiencing DNA damage, unfolded protein response, viral infection, you name it, that specific cell. That's where we can do something because at this stage, it's still signaling. At still stage is still adaptation to stress, which you can boost. We can make the cells stronger. We can make them better at surviving viral infection. We can do whatever we want at this level. And if, we, if the cells can make it, they will survive. And that's perfectly fine, I told you earlier. What happens if they cannot make it? They cross a point of no return that we don't still agree on, a point of no return that is difficult to define, a point of no return that will probably even differ in different cell type. And this brings about two phenomenon, phenomena. One is the cause of cell death. Why the cell, that specific cell is dying? What is killing that cell? And another one is all of the processes that are now activated. And those are very important because those will be the, the very processes that talk to the organism when the cell is dead. They are not necessarily the same thing. Most often they are completely different, right? So, and this causes regulated cell death as we define it. So the breakdown of the plasma membrane of the cell. So now the cell is dead. <clears throat> what does, how cells are dying? What is the actual cause of death? The actual cause of death is when cells are losing the very essence of life, which is the ability to, com to control entropy in a limited microenvironment, which basically is two things, is energy, so ATP levels, and the control of the microenvironment. So at space, on which they can control biochemical reaction. How this is broken down? Oxidative damage to membranes. So cells are dying because of oxidation and because of lack of ATP. This can be accelerated, retarded, tweaked, can be changing outcome by lots of things, but that's the very, the very cause of death. Then cashews are activated. Yes, they are. And they will accelerate it. Yes, they will. But they're not causing it. Cells don't die because of cashews activation. Cells die because cashews activation precipitate a scenario where there's too much oxidative damage and there's too much loss of ATP. 
So the, all of this I told you now is from the perspective of that very single cell that got stressed at the very beginning. But I told you this is not happening somewhere in a magical space where there's only that cell. This is happening in the organism. So now things are becoming a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> First of all, as I told you earlier, there's this uh, accidental cell death and uh, we cannot do anything about it because there's no pharmacological modulation, there's no genetic intervention. It's a bomb, put a bomb next to your cell. When the bomb explodes, you can put it in the, any sort of genetic background, the cell is dead. Here, <clears throat> from the point of no return to the permeabilization of the membranes, which is what we define cell death, yeah, maybe we, if we wanna do something to make it faster, we can, but we can perhaps even delay it, but we will not save the cells. This is gonna happen, yes or yes. This is basically the death sentence has been pronounced here. This is just a way of disposing the bodies of those cells. But again, this happens in the context of other cells. Other cells that are same cell type because you're in tissue, there's epithelial cells all over, one, one gets infected, it dies, that, what happens to the other cells? And immune cells. So both types of cell death, both the regulated one and the accidental one are associated with the spillage of things into the microenvironment. That spillage contains molecules that were there, including potentially cytotoxic molecules like reactive oxygen species that can cause regulated cell death in other cells. But most importantly, these dying cells also release immunomodulatory molecules, which we call DAMPs for damage associated molecular patterns. These are signals that dead cells send, that dying and dead cells send to the immune system so that they tell the organism, there is a problem here, please come solve the problem. And these DAMPs will modulate sometimes positively, sometimes negatively immune or inflammatory reaction. And these are key for the preservation of another thing, which is now the homeostasis of the organism. So all of this is a, is a way for the organism to get rid of cells that could be dangerous. Imagine you have cells with unrepaired DNA damage. This is potentially a cancer cells in 10 years from now. Do you want it to be around? No, you don't. So you kill it. You have a system for the cell to undergo regulated cell death. And you make sure that the corpses are taken up in the right manner by the rest of the organism. And this is what the immune system does. Everybody has a different number for that. I, I will put it down in, uh, in a very scientific, non-scientific manner, which is a lot of cells die in your body every day. And you're not sick. You don't die of autoimmune disorders. You don't die of, of inflammation. Your skin is not falling apart. Your intestine is not falling apart. Why? Because of this part here, because cells that are dying are calling the immune system to prevent your body to basically disassemble for inflammation. So, and, the, and this takes us to the outcome of cell death. So cell death, I told you, can be silent as happens on a daily basis in the, in the body of a healthy person, but not necessarily. Cell death can also be immunologically active and generate an immune response. And this is very important, for instance, when you get a viral infection. You get a viral infection, the, the virus is killing the cells that they, that they infect at the very end. It's a way for the virus to release new particles that will infect other cells. Uh, but these dying cells now are capable to elicit a, a virus-specific immune response. And this is also the case of some cancer cells. And this is, um, you don't need adjuvants there. You don't need you know, what you get in a vaccine because these damps, these immune stimulatory molecules I mentioned earlier, those are the natural adjuvants that are encoded and contained in your cells for let the immune system recognize, okay, here, this is not normal um, um, intestinal homeostasis. This is a viral infection. So now I need an immune response. And this involves several steps, including the uptake of body from the dying cells by antigen presenting cells. Those are uh, most often dendritic cells and their precursors, 
the dendritic cells are good to migrate to lymph nodes. They get activated by these damps I mentioned. In the lymph nodes, dendritic cells can prime T cells, and these T cells now are specific for the very cell type that was uh, dying at the very beginning. And again, it can be virus infected cells, it can be cancer cells, and we will we'll tell you, I'll tell you in a second, what are the specific, um, the specific requirement for cell death to be perceived as immunogenic by the immune system. Uh, this is funny because probably many of you have heard about the cancer immunity cycle, uh, which was, was published back in the days by Chen and Manuel, actually, um, and, and Guido and I were not uh, fun enough. We're not, we were not uh, inventive enough. We called this immunogenic cell death and, and it didn't become as famous as the cancer immunity, immunity cycle, but we, we, at least we did our best. And you can see we published this a bit earlier than those other guys did. Okay, what do you need for cell death to be immunogenic? You need lots of stuff because normally the organism does not want cell death to be immunogenic because again, you, you, you have to keep together. So if you don't have any of this stuff, again, cell death is just silent. Uh, your epithelial cells of the intestine are dying. The macrophages come around, they pick them up and everything is done. No problem, no inflammation, nothing else. Um, so you need obviously cell death. Without cell death, there's no immunogenic cell death. Cell deaths um, can come with other ingredients. The most important one to generate an adaptive immune response. So an antigen specific immune response is antigenicity. So your cells need to express antigens that your body has never seen before. So why? Because if your body has seen them before, it means that you have been tolerized. It means that you don't have any more CD8 positive and CD4 positive T cells against those antigens. So it doesn't matter because you don't have the capacity to mount an immune response if you don't have antigenicity. And when you think about it, many people think about antigenicity as something that is intrinsic to the, to the cells, but it's not. Antigenicity, it's a combination of cells and host. Because if I, were, I was tolerized by a specific antigen when my thymus was developing and you, did, you were not, that same antigens in my body will not be recognized, in your body will be recognized. So antigenicity comes from the cells and the, that specific host in which they are living into. Obviously, viral antigens, most of the time, we have never seen them until we get infected. When we get infected, the immune system will be activated. Normal antigens, most of us have seen them. So most of us will not get an immune response when a normal cell die. But when you think about autoimmune disorders, autoimmune disorders happen when you have a cell that is a normal cell, but now magically that, seed, that clone was not removed from the peripheral or, or central tolerance. So now you get an immune response against a normal cell, but not everybody gets it. So it, again, it's a mix between cells and hosts. Then you need, and, and if you don't have antigenicity, so what you get is when you get in front of dying cells is inflammation normally, but not an adaptive immune response. You just inflammation that will resolve. It's like when you get a scratch on your arm, you're going to be inflammation, but you don't get an immune disorder. You can have antigenicity, so that's cool, but you might lack these signals, which is ad adjuvanticity, these damps. Maybe your cells that are dying are unable to emit them when they die. Maybe your immune system has mutation that is unable to perceive them. So this is not going to happen. And actually, when you have antigenicity, but not adjuvanticity, you become tolerized towards an antigen. Now you don't, this is not silent anymore. This is active tolerance. If I come back later with the good ingredients, your body will no longer be able to respond because of this tolerization. <clears throat> and this is a bit what they do for allergic reaction anyway. Maybe you have all you need from a cell perspective. You have cell death, you have the antigens, you have the dams, but your microenvironment is not permissive. Maybe the, there's no immune cells in the microenvironment, so it's not going to happen, obviously, right? Or the immune cells are there, you enable priming, but then the target is protected. And, and, and so the, the execution phase is not going to happen. And only if you have all these four ingredients, now you have 
a cell that, that is associated with antigenicity with the emission of immunostimulatory signals that enable these dendritic cells to come around, go to the lymph node, prime an immune response that comes back and now kills the cells that express these antigens. This is so important from an evolutionary perspective that both viruses and cancer cells have evolved a lot of ways to avoid it. And this can go down to uh, basically all of the steps here. Um, the viruses and the cancer cells can somehow try to circumvent it. For instance, they can become resistance to dying. We know that most of the oncogenes are anti-death protein. Why? First of all, because they don't wanna die, but also because they don't wanna engage the immune system. They can become very good at not releasing these immune stimulatory signals. There's, for instance, limited ATP release, and we know ATP is, um, is driven by, ATP release is uh, driven by autophagy. Um, there's deficiency in all of these danger signals. There's uh, active immunosuppression. For instance, uh, cancer cells are very good at upregulating this, uh, um, this signal here, which is called PDL1, and PDL1 is basically a stop signal for T cells. So uh, this co comes in different. Uh, consequences, but there's also ways to circumvent it pharmacologically. And that's where we come with combinatorial strategies that want to convert what has become non-immunogenic cell death into, again, immunogenic cell death. And I'm going to talk to you about autophagy because autophagy is one of those things that has a high degree of context dependency. So in some stage, in some steps, getting autophagy activation for the sake of generating an immune response is good. And in other scenario, getting autophagy activation for the sake of um, uh, generating an immune response is bad. So what happened with autophagy classically, I, I told you earlier, autophagy is a cytoprotective pathway for cancer cells. Cancer cells take advantage of autophagy to survive stress as all cells. So it was pretty much of a simple strategy initially to say, okay, we have a drug. Here I put radiation, but you can put any other drug. <laughs> we know that this drug generates cancer cell killing uh, <clears throat> to some degree, not entirely because the, the cancer cells are heterogeneous. Some, some of them are more sensitive. Some of them are less sensitive, but we kill a part of it, not good enough. So we want to make it better. And we use autophagy inhibitors as easy as that. We know that they are there to, <clears throat> autophagy is there to protect the cells. So we take it out and we, we let cancer cells die more. And I always call this Starbucks approach. And this works. I mean, it works in plate, in petri dishes, it works fantastically. It even works in immunodeficient animals. This is a, <clears throat> sorry, uh, immunodeficient bulb C animals where we had uh, control cells called scramble or ATG5 knockdown, so autophagy deficient cells, and we irradiated them. You see, this is this empty, sorry, this, this, uh, um, yeah, this empty symbol are the irradiated cells. And you see nicely, autophagy deficient cells, they are less capable of uh, standing the cytotoxicity of radiation, so they die more and the, the, the tumor growth is reduced more. Um, so one would say, okay, <clears throat> this thing work, right? Autophagy inhibition is a good strategy when it comes to uh, cancer cell treatment. Um, so people went into clinical trials with that. They use two agents that are available for use in humans so far. Those agents are called chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Um, they have problems, but they can be used. They are not very, I mean, they're fairly safe. They have side effects, of course. And this is now an outdated uh, uh, table that I always use. There are probably some more now in the literature. But basically, this tells you that, yes, when you combine chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine with a clinically employed anti-cancer agent that can be radiation, can be chemotherapy, um, you can see uh, here some of the list. It's safe, yes, but it does not work. Best case, best result in this table is that a little bit of an improved control of a met metastasis with a p-value of 0 0.046, which is, yeah, significant, but okay. And there was no difference in survival. So maybe the Starbucks approach, maybe just killing more cancer cells doesn't really matter, doesn't really work. Um, and this is the same thing. And why I told you earlier why, 
because when it comes to organismal homeostasis, you don't just focus on what happens to cancer cells or to cells in general, you also focus to what the immune system is doing, right? And we know autophagy is very important for this communication between dying cells and the immune system. It's important in a dual way, but let's go first one step at a time. Let's um, first discuss when it's a good thing. So, okay, this did not work in the clinic. So we decided to take another approach, which was, okay, now we don't want to use autophagy inhibitors anymore. We know that they might increase the amount of cells that die in response to treatment, but we also suspect that this will not generate an immune control. So the few cells that are still around will cause disease relapse. So we decided, let's take a riskier approach. Let's use autophagy activators, right? We know we are gonna lose part of the cytotoxic response because autophagy, again, is good for cancer cells. But maybe we're gonna be enabling now a better immune control. So the immune control will take care of the few cells that survived cytotoxicity of the treatment. And I call this the expressive approach. Um, and we started to look for like data supporting this con contention, right? And, and first, this is, this is a science paper from 2011. Here we used autophagy deficient cells, as I told you earlier. In this case, though, this was a, an immunocompetent animal. You see here, the immunocompetent wild type animal, when we treat control cells with mitoxantron, which is a, a chemotherapy that induces this immunogenic cell death, we get a good tumor control. But when the cancer cells are now autophagy deficient, we lose entirely their, if the control of the disease. <clears throat> Same thing um, when we do vaccination tests. You know, uh, immunogenic cell death, one way to test it is you take your cells in a plate, you kill them with what you think is an immunogenic cell death inducer. And if it is true, then you can use these dying cells as a vaccine. And then you come two weeks later with living cells of the same type, of course, and then you check whether the mice are prophylactically protected from this new challenge with living cells. And if you're good at inducing immunogenic cell death, as you can see here in the right, you protect 80% to 100% of your mice against the injection of living cells. So you vaccinate your mice as easy as that, as easy as a COVID vaccine. Right? If it's good, you don't get COVID. Yeah, if you vaccinate it with a good dying cell, they don't get cancer, right? Of course, the same cancer with the same cells. But when you use now, can in, the vac in a vaccine injection, you now use cancer cells that are lacking autophagy genes, now you lose the capacity of your vaccine to protect the mice. So you lose the ability of cells, dying cells to be immunogenic. And we tracked it down to the fat that autophagy, as you can see here, is responsible for the release of ATP from dying cells. This is in vivo data with, again, ATG5 or ATG7 of dying cells. So we went one step further. We said, okay, autophagy, we know that inhibiting autophagy might be bad for the immune system. Can we do something by activating autophagy? So how do you activate autophagy? Well, there's a very simple way. You starve your mice. You starve your mice for 24 hours, you get massive whole body activation of autophagy. You can do that in, in tumor bearing mice. Here is, is wild type mice bearing uh, fibrosarcoma cells from the same uh, syngenetic background. And you can do it together with uh, chemotherapy and you see nicely how the chemotherapy had some control of the disease. And this is getting maximized by the uh, NF, which in this case are Newton free for one day a single episode of starvation together with chemotherapy basically doubled the ability of this drug to control the tumor. And yes, it's not related to anything else than to an immune response, because if you do the same trick in immunodeficient animals, now it doesn't work anymore. So it's not related to reducing the speed of cancer cell growth, it's not related to hormone signaling, it's just an immune response, at least in the setting. Okay, nobody wants to starve their patients, so we concentrated our attention on molecules that do the same thing, but they do not induce any weight loss. If you starve your mouse, it's gonna lose 10% of the weight in 24 hours, 
20% in 48 hours. They do not stand three days of starvation. Obviously, it's not the same for humans. If you starve yourself for a day, you're not going to lose 10% of the weight. You, everybody wished that. You, you're probably going to lose like 500 grams, best case scenario. But nonetheless, you know, cancer patients have, my, have cachexia, have problems of uh, muscle wasting, and you don't want to starve them. No clinician would allow you to starve your patient, even though probably some patient could take it. So we focused our attention back in the days of molecules that also activate autophagy, but as you can see here down right, they do not induce any weight loss. And you can do exactly the same thing. You can combine it with chemotherapy and they, in all cases, extend the ability of chemotherapy to control tumor progression in wild type animals. And if you do the trick in uh, nude mice, it doesn't work. So again, an immune response. You can do it in different models, it doesn't matter. So we can conclude that maybe the espresso approach is good. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that, right? And it basically speaks about the fact that autophagy has several effects, not only in the same cell that is activated in or in the neighboring cells, but also in distant cells through endocrine circuitries. And this is what we developed in our lab recently. And um, so as you probably uh, have heard, I moved from a chemotherapy-oriented lab with Vido to a radiotherapy-oriented lab here in, in Way Cornell. And when you move to a radiotherapy lab, the, the, the first thing you hear is that the, there's a holy grail, which is called Abscopa response. Abscopa response basically is a complicated word to tell you that when you have a patient with uh, several metastases and uh, this patient needs to get one of them irradiated for any reason, sometimes, very rarely, you see that all of the metastases go away. Not only the one that you irradiated in this case was a non-small cell lung carcinoma patient. You can see you got irradiation to a liver lesion, but you also had lung lesion, mediastinal lesion. All of that was gone. You can see that PET scan before treatment in August 2020, you see all of these black dots are lesions. You can see the PET scan not even six months later, and you can see the PET scan. This patient is still alive as we speak, which is basically the short word for a miracle. And, and Sandra De Maria and collaborators demonstrated that this thing in mice at least, it's an immune response. So you can model it in mice, you can have two different tumors, you can irradiate a single one, which is in this case, primary tumors here. And of course the tumor that you irradiate, you can control it. But if you irradiate the primary tumor in a good way, together with the good immunotherapy, in this case is flit ligand, you can control a distant lesion that you did not irradiate. Why is this an immune response? Because if you do it in immunodeficient animals, it doesn't work anymore. And also because if you're an immunocompetent animal on the contralateral side, you put a distinct tumor, it doesn't work anymore. So this is an antigen specific immune response that you can elicit with radiation. The same lab and others demonstrated that basically abscopal response start when irradiated cancer cells accumulate DNA in the cytosol and this drives the secretion of a cytokine, which is called type 1 interferon, that initiates all this process I told you earlier with dendritic cells coming around, migrating to the lymph node, priming T cells, and T cells being able to recognize the same cells that initiated the, pro the protocol. Um, so when we joined the lab, well, the department, um, there was lots of data out there um, saying that autophagy can actually inhibit the point interferon secretion in multiple settings, right? Um, but there was nothing on radiation. So we, we, we sat down to check what autophagy would do in the abscopa responses to radiation. And this is work from a postdoc of mine, Takahiro and Marisa. Uh, so the first thing, first we generated autophagy deficient cells. Um, these are uh, mammary adenocarcinoma TSA cells uh, from mouse. You can see here um, when you do ATG5 knockouts, you, you lose ATG5, you lose the ATG5, ATG7, comp, ATG12 complex up here. When you do ATG7 knockout, you, you lose ATG7, you lose the complex because ATG7 is responsible for the formation of the complex, but you don't lose obviously monomeric ATG5. And we first checked that these cells are actually autophagy deficient and, and they are, you can, you can see very nicely how control cells um, they respond to starva starvation and radiation with the diminution in P62. P62 is a substrate for autophagy. So it is supposed to go down when you have 
an autoph autophagy driver. And this is lysosomal dependent because when you add bafilomycin, it doesn't work anymore. So pretty much standard. And when you look at ATG7 or ATG5, none of this is happening. P62 is not degraded. See here, no degradation, no degradation uh, by radiation or by um, starvation. So yes, these cells are not able to undergo autophagy. We checked that all the things that we expected to be true were true. And this is a, just to show you that basically when you irradiate these cells in vitro, indeed, when they lack ATG5 or ATG7, they are more sensitive to radiation. This is the control cells in, in yellow. And when you go at eight gray radiation, uh, they are more sensitive. So they have less um, PI negative cells and the same for 20 gray. So yes, these cells as expected, they are uh, more uh, radio sensitive. And we can do that in other ways. This is a clonogenic assay. Uh, it's basically telling you the same thing. And this is no news whatsoever. Here, we started to have a problem. I told you earlier that when you do immunogenic cell death testing, vaccination testing, and, and you do it with control cells, you can protect a sizable amount of your mice. Very nice, up to 80%. When you do it with autophagy deficient cells, this no longer works. Um, and this is with chemotherapy. We were expecting to see similar things with radiation therapy and no way, ATG5 knockout cells, ATG7 knockout cells, they are as good as control cells in protecting the animals. Actually, radiation is a very strong immunogenic cell death inducer. You see here in prophylactic tests, you get 100% of protection and it doesn't matter if these cells are lacking ATG5 or ATG7. So here we started to think, oh, maybe there's something different here. And indeed, when we went into immunocompetent animals, single lesions, all right, um, we treated the tumors with radiation, red curve, we got a nice control disease, and we inhibited autophagy, which in the chemo setting would reduce the capacity of these mice to control the disease. And here, no way, here we get an improvement of the capacity of these mice to control the disease. And you can do the same trick with knockout cells. You see these blue and red dotted lines. They are as good as radiation or as control cells or even better to some degree. So yes, autophagy is not required for the capacity of radiation to drive an immune response in vivo. Um, and okay, we had this interferon story. So we focus on the interferon story and indeed as expected, inhibiting autophagy pharmacologically as you can see here in, in, uh, in uh, black and uh, uh, gray, or genetically, ameliorates the ability of radiation to drive type 1 interferon secretion. This is RT-PCR, you see radiation alone, and radiation plus inhibition of autophagy. This is radiation alone and radiation in autophagy deficient cells. And you can do it also by ELISA, but it's the same thing. So yes, autophagy inhibits the ability of radiation to provoke type 1 interferon secretion. Is this anyhow dependent on C and sting? There was previous data uh, demonstrating that, and yes, it is. So if you do radiation, you have a type one interferon secretion. If you do it with, with the inhibition of autophagy, you have it better. But if you remove from the cells either C gas or sting, which are the sensor for cytostolic DNA, you completely blunt your uh, secretion. Uh, so again, we knew that type 1 interferon secretion driven by radiation would be related to the accumulation of cytosolic DNA. And we checked for that. There is, we developed, we optimized um, um, a technology to detect specifically cytosolic DNA. This is very important because we have a, a double-stranded DNA-specific antibody that at least theoretically would stain the nucleus and the mitochondrial matrix if we have to have a normal full permeabilization of the membrane. So we permeabilize these cells in a way that neither the mitochondrial matrix nor the nucleus are accessible to the antibodies. So we detect specifically cytostolic DNA. And you can see here, when you irradiate the cells, you have an increase in cytostolic DNA as compared to control. When you do it together with autophagy inhibition, big pharmacological or genetic, this increase is better. So autophagy, in a way or another prevents uh, the accumulation of cytosolic DNA in irradiated cells. At that time, the paradigm was that radiation does this trick by driving the accumulation of so-called micronuclei. Micronuclei are nuclear 
portions that are generated by cells that are unable to undergo uh, mitosis in a normal manner. And we know radiation is messing up with the nucleus, DNA damage, and potentially driving this uh, so-called mitotic catastrophe that is associated with micronuclei. And we also knew that autophagy is a good trash for micronuclei. I told you earlier, autophagy is a good trash for permeabilized mitochondria, but it's also a good trash for micronuclei. So we decided to check which of these species would be involved there. And we started to do uh, staining uh, and we stained our double-stranded DNA in irradiated cells. And this is the red dot you see here. And at the same time, we stained markers of the, of the nucleus. And this case is lamin uh, B. First of all, in our condition, which is, which is 24 hours and 48 hours after radiation, we do not detect considerable micronucleation in these cells. We believe it's coming later. But also when you look at these pictures and these movies, you don't see lots of co-localization. So you don't expect these dots to come from the nucleus. Um, on the contrary, when we now stain these double-stranded DNA dots in red and a marker of mitochondria as COX-4, you see a very nice pseudo-colocalization, um, which suggests that maybe mitochondria DNA is the source of the cytosolic spot we observe in irradiated cells. Of course, this is just observational for the moment. We can, we can quantify that. And if you quantify that, you see that indeed the dots we observe in the cytosol of irradiated cells, they do not co-localize with lamin B and they instead co-localize much better with COX-4. And they also co-localize with TFAM, which is a mitochondrial transcription, transcription factor. Again, suggesting that they might come from mitochondria. And this is the quantification. Do they really come from mitochondria? Well, there's a way to check it in a mechanistic manner, not just observational, correlational manner, I told you so far. And how do you do that? We you generate so-called rosier cells. Rosier cells are ghosts that no longer contain or contain very little mitochondrial DNA. You can see here, this is the genomic DNA band. This is the mitochondrial DNA band. So they are, they are highly depleted in mitochondrial DNA. So you can generate them and now you can irradiate them. And when you irradiate them, you can see here in the picture, but down there in the quantification, these cells are no longer able to accumulate double-stranded DNA in the cytosol, meaning that now mechanistically, we know that the DSDNA accumulated in the cytosol of irradiated cells comes from mitochondria. Or you can look at this a confoca, doesn't matter. The next question is what happens to type one interferon? Are rho zero cells able now to produce type 1 interferon when you irradiate them? And the answer is no, they can no longer do it. And we were actually happy to see that the literature was supporting our finding. Um, this is work from Ben Kyle uh, in, in Australia demonstrating that backs and back are actually responsible for the er herniation of mitochondrial DNA when you get mitochondrial permeabilization. And uh, if you remember this thing here, you see how the co-localization is like, there's some co-localization, but also something is just opposed to each other. And we believe what we were seeing there was exactly this kind of phenomenon where you have some of the mitochondrial DNA bulging out of mitochondria that are permeabilized. So we check for the implication of backs and back and all these guys from the BCL2 family members. And indeed, when in our cells, we overexpress BCL2, so we prevent permeabilization, we, we inhibit permeabilization, we do, see, we do see decrease accumulation of cytosol DNA and mildly decrease uh, secretion of their point of interferon. We believe that the effect is marginal because these cells are already BCL2 competent. So we are just adding a little bit to their capacity of protecting themselves. If you look on the right one, you instead we deleted backs and back, taking advantage of the Bert Vogelstein HCT116 cells. Now you see a, a complete blunting in the release of cytosolic DNA here and a halving of the amount of type 1 interferon secreted upon irradiation. This is not important. So at that time, we had at that step, we had basically two separate stories. We had autophagy is inhibiting type 1 interferon by radiation. And mitochondrial DNA is responsible for that. Are they two interconnected somehow, or are we seeing two different phenomena? And to check that, we generated row zero cells in the ATG5 and ATG7 knockout background. So now we went for, to check for cytosol DNA. And as I showed you earlier, when you irradiate cells that are, that are autophagy deficient, you get more cytosol DNA, but this is basically gone when these cells are also mitochondrial DNA deficient. So yes, autophagy is working the same pathway. And you can do that with uh, 
um, other technology. You can do that uh, um, in the ATG7. You can do that with uh, <clears throat> hydroxychloroquine. It's always the same. When you combine autophagy inhibition in a row zero scenario, you lose all the advantage you had before and you, you blunt it out. Okay, so we wanted to check this in a mouse in a model of upscopal responses. I told you earlier, this is how you do it. You take a mouse, you put two tumors, and you radiate just one, potentially in the context of systemically inactive drugs. You need systemically inactive drugs because obviously both tumors are exposed to systemic drugs. And this is what you get in control condition. This is pretty much exactly as it observed before by the De Maria lab. So if you focus up here, this is the tumor the tumor that gets irradiated. And if you focus down here, this is the tumor that does not get irradiated. So first of all, you see that um, 9H10, which is a CTLA-4 blockers, has no effect. And this is important. So there is no effect from checkpoint blockage in this model. So when you start irradiating the, the tumors, yeah, they respond. I mean, obviously you irradiate them and they respond better when you also use a checkpoint blocker systemically. Actually, you can get out of 80% disease eradication at the irradiated site. Remember, this is the irradiated site. Now we should look at the non-irradiated site. So when you don't radiate, obviously you see nothing on the, on the other side, right? Also, when you use CTLA-4 blockage alone, it's, it's systemically inactive. So it's inactive here as here. When you irradiate only, also not good enough to generate an, an upscopa response. You need to have radiation on the other side of the mouse and systemic GTLA-4 blockers. Now you start to see something and you start to see it better when you have three times eight gray, which is an immunostimulatory uh, dose and fractionation. Okay, but you, you see here, the tumors, the secondary tumor never gets ablated. You control it if you do things good, but never gets ablated when you are in the wild type setting. When now you go in a ATG knockout setting in the primary tumor, the, the side that you irradiate, you amplify the response locally. But we knew that we I showed you like 10, smile, 10 slides ago that yeah, ATG5 and 7 knockout are more sensitive to radiation. So now we radiate them. Yes, they are more sensitive. But look at these sides of the deal now. This is the tumors that you don't irradiate. And now when the other tumors are ATG5 or ATG7 knockout, you get up to 40% complete disease eradication. So now we have scenario where by irradiating one of the two tumors, if this tumor are ATG5 or ATG7 deficient, you get systemic disease eradication. These mice were free of disease, which never happens with the scramble white type tumors. You see the, the secondary tumor never gets ablated when the primary is a white type. This depends on the point interference. You probably suspected that, but if you block the type of interferon signaling here, the you know dotted green line in the abscopal non-irradiated thing, you go back to nothing. And instead you have it when you, you don't block it. Uh, this is a long, long story that probably we should skip. I just wanted to show you this, okay? We, we seek for some sort of value of that in patients. And you can stratify patients for being autophagy high, autophagy low, the autophagy high obviously go not so well, autophagy low go better, this is breast cancer patients, <clears throat> all good. Um, but I think the piece that we were missing in our story, and if you, if you check type 1 interference signaling, yeah, the higher autophagy, the lower type 1 interference signaling, the higher autophagy, the lower type 2 interference, so cytotoxic T cell activation, all as in our model. But the piece that was missing, and I think the piece where we got a bit inventive was this one. Our model predicted that high autophagy would result in low mitochondrial DNA. Um, in, in, and in the mouse, we demonstrated that, right? It was simple. It, how do you demonstrate that in patients where you have transcription signature, but you don't have a quantity for mitochondrial DNA and you don't have a, if you do it in a few patients, it's complicated. So we wanted to take advantage of, of big data sets. So we thought, okay, we cannot use mitochondrial DNA. Maybe we can use mitochondrial RNA as a measure of mitochondria, right? The problem is that this, all these uh, original data sets were doing in the pre-RNA-seq era when it was poly-A driven chip quantification and mitochondrial RNA doesn't have poly-A tails. So forget about it. So how did we got inventive here? We said, okay, we know that mitochondria contain lots of protein, 
that are coded by nuclear genes, nuclear gene with a poly A tail. So we did a big score of all the nuclear transcripts coding for mitochondrial proteins. And we then checked the abundance of this score based on an autophagy score. And you can see here, the higher the autophagy score, which goes on this uh, X axis, so the blue is the highest autophagy score, the lowest the amount of nuclear transcripts coding for mitochondrial genes, mitochondrial proteins, sorry. Basically telling you that the higher autophagy in these samples, the lower the mitochondrial content of these samples. And you can do other stuff, not important. I think it's time to conclude, otherwise you guys will be suicidal. So this is the model we have now for, for the autophagy and scopal responses. So we think that you, when you radiate a cell, at least early you generate mitochondrial permeabilization. And so you expose mitochondrial DNA to the cytosols where it can be detected by C-gas and sting, driving the point of interference secretion and hence recruiting immunogenic cell that driven anti-cancer immunity. What can we do about it? So we demonstrated in another paper that I didn't have time to present today that Caspers 3 blocks this, right? And other people did the same. So there are Caspers blockers, uh, but also from a clinical perspective, they kind of failed in the clinic and uh, oncologists, they're not ready to listen to the reason in the caspases are not killing the cell. They are just changing their manif immunological manifestation, even though we know it's true. Um, maybe one day, but not so, not so quick. We know that autophagy inhibits that, but modulating autophagy in a patient is very complicated for a billion reasons. First, first of them, we don't have a selective agent yet. Second of them, normal cells need autophagy. So it's difficult to target autophagy in a patient with systemic measures. But we have this beautiful drug here, which is called venetoclax, which is a BCL2 inhibitor that promotes mitochondrial permeabilization. So we are now engaged in a project where we want to use venetoclax not as a cytotoxic agent on top of radiation. We want to use venetoclax as an immunostimulant. So autophagy inhibition or activation, I told you autophagy is a contact dependent stuff. It's very difficult, but there is there are rules there, okay? And um, it goes down to the Starbucks Express dilemma. So if you are in the US and you enter a Starbucks, stay away from espresso. It's not a good idea to get an espresso in Starbucks. When you are in Venice, there's no Starbucks. So you're done, it's easy, right? That's and, and in, in the scientific and medical terms, this probably talks about how autophagy is activated in the system. Do you need infiltration by immune cells? Do you need type point interference secretion? Do you need autophagy and ATP secretion downstream? What are the real, the feature of the tumor you're trying to treat with an autophagy activator or inhibitor? And obviously, as I mentioned before, we need targeted agents we, we don't have so far. So why there's so many ways to die? And I think it uh, it's all goes down to we need ways for dying cells to tell the rest of the organism what they should do with corpses. Should they you know, bury them very silently or should they build out of them an immune response that will take care of potential pathogens coming back or, or dormant cancer cells or anything that may be a threat for the organism? Um, this is work from lots of people, as you can imagine. I mentioned Taka uh, and Emma and are the drivers of this uh, um, Venetoclax story now. Um, Marisa was involved in the um, um, autophagy story, the autophagy paper together with Taka, and this is the rest of the team, including the uh, emotional support uh, animal that is, has been probably more well behaved than I would expect. And this is lots of acknowledgements. We don't need to mention them all. They, they know that uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to do anything. And with this, I'm happy to take any questions. Amazing, Lorenzo. Thank you. Amazing, Lorenzo. Did you, put, did you put the spritz in any of, of your paper? Uh, no, I am not like Pauli Matzinger yet. I, um, I, I, I thought about it. I actually thought about it. Yeah, he participates to some of the talks, uh, but that's it. <laughs> so let's start with uh, some questions. And anyone? So I have a question here. It's a quick right. one. Um, let's think to put together my question. So at the end of your talk, 
you demonstrated that maybe caspase tree inhibition could have um, a role in this interferon type one interferon production. So I wonder if you tested or anyone tested the role of caspase one in this story because all of your story also fits well for parptosis and inflammasome activation because autophagy can also inhibit inflammasome activation. And also this uh, DNA is sensed by M2 inflammasome or an ALAP3 inflammasome that can induce parptosis and parptosis could fit well in this whole cycle of story. And I wonder if you see this. Yeah, we did. Um, so we have a, a model that to answer the question, to explain very quickly. Well, it's, a, it's an endogenous model of uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer that we generate with a carcinogen, right? And the model is associated with um, uh, tumorigenesis, but you cannot stop it. So you get one tumor, you treat that tumor, and but maybe during treatment, you will get another tumor, right? And But you can measure the time uh, that you get the other tumors and you can measure the growth of the other tumors, of course, and they can be untreated or not, not on treatment, depending on the treatment you use. Um, and then you can, you can, obviously, the death of the mouse depends on the sum of, the tu of all the tumors. So if you have five tumors, you have to sum them all, right? So in that model, we use radiation alone and combined with different agents, including, going to your question, uh, anakinra as a blocker of interleukin 1 beta. Mm -hmm. Okay, the results, the results we have are actually puzzling to us and we still need to understand them because we have them in multiple scenario. So when we add anakinra to radiation, we partially lose control of the primary tumor. So the tumor that, that is irradiated. So that tumor grows faster, okay? which is weird, but the overall survival of the animals is exactly the same as the overall survival of the animals that receive radiation only. Why? Because the secondary tumors, now they don't grow. So we lose control of the tumor that is irradiated, but the secondary tumor are under what we believe to be immunological control. So now we are in this weird scenario where we have to understand, of course, what's going on, but, but we are obviously very interested in that. And, and we want to check, first of all, if, if it's entirely immune related. So we're going to do the same experiment in a new mouse or in a you know, CD4, CD8 depleted mouse, whatever, and check, which I believe it is. Um, but after that, if it's really is, I really don't know what, what I should look at. <laughs> it's a bit of a mess. So yeah. why so many ways to die? <laughs> exactly. And, and even more complicated, sometimes we have seen it just with radiation. So because you can use radiation in different flavors, right? You can use different doses and different fractionation. I mean, with mm -hmm. anakinra, you have a systemic thing, which is more complicated to, to interpret. Even though that the fact that it has one effect on one lesion and another effect on another lesion, it's kind of puzzling. But when you do radiation, for instance, we do 20 gray two times. And we have a fantastic, we basically ablate the primary lesion. So we take it away, we burn it away. Right? We use all eight gray six times and we have some control of the primary lesion, but not as good as 20 times two. Overall survival, exactly the same. Why? Because again, the other lesions are, 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 are growing in reverse manner. And uh, we even thought about some, in the past, there was some paper about anti-angiogenic agents that are promoted by the primary tumor. So when you remove the primary tumor, the secondary tumor gets more angiogenic, something like that. We, we, we will, we're gonna try to investigate that thing. So nice. And does that also happen in the uh, skin model or the immune no, uh, it, deficient model? No, in, we, we never saw that in the, um, uh, how do you call it in, in the in the mouse in the mouse model where we had this TSA cells, the subcutaneous one. Um, also, one other the, the the other model that we have this endogenous model. The, technically, the tumors are different tumors; they're not mats, right? So the immune response you generate 
should be against shared antigens, right? It's not a mutation that is a primary tumor that I can expect to be in all of the tumor. It's not going to be there. Maybe some, but not all of them. So we have data supporting the notion that the immune response we generate is actually against normal mammary antigens that are shared by obviously all the mammary tumors. And we indeed, we can vaccinate the mice with normal organoids for normal mammary glands, and we delay tumorigenesis. So it's just a strange scenario that we are very passionate about, but uh, burns a lot of mice, a lot of money, a lot of postdocs. <laughs> Uh, Lorenzo, just, just uh, uh, do you think this um, so some role for the trained immunity? So you just also increased, you know, the innate immune response, like as a basal level. Yeah, I think NK have a role there. Actually, our model is a very NK evasive. Uh, so. When we do the model in, in uh, um, rag gamma mice, so there's no T, no B, and no NK, the model goes faster. So you get tumors that are earlier and they grow faster. When we do it in, in rag 2 mice, so when there's no B and no T, but the NKs are there, it's exactly as in a wild type. So at least initially, the tumor is under control by NK and probably it evades it at some stage. So I think that what we do also there with radiation, we bring back some NK control. Very, I very think Hugo has a... Hugo. Uh, thank you, Professor. Yeah, it was a really great presentation. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was thinking about um, you, if I, underst if I understood very well, uh, the autophagy is, is a really important process to uh, for tumor patients, actually, because I think because if the autophagy is very important to uh, find, again, the, the tumor, uh, I was thinking the possibility, for example, the patient um, submitting the process of a treatment to the cancer and at the same time have infection. Uh, I'm not sure. In fact, maybe uh, infection inhib inhibit the autophagy. Do you think in this case could going to happen something similar with your results? Like, uh, for example, a patient have a tumor um, and there is a pathogen inhibit the autophagy and for that reason cause some similar problems that you uh, tell us. I'm not sure if I'm thinking so much, but I was thinking about the, the possibility that there is a different kind of uh, agents to hide uh, different kind of uh, cell deaths. Yeah, I, I think it's very important what you raised, which is um, how autophagy changes from, pa from patient to patient, how autophagy changes in different stages of tumor genesis, right? If we stop thinking about therapy for a second, um, there is some sort of consensus that autophagy in healthy cells, so in your normal cells, is actually very good for you because it keeps you alive and, and it prevents the trash accumulation, everything. And this is supported by lots of data in the mouse. Uh, for instance, there's no autophagy deficient mouse that goes through weaning. They all die. If you take out HD5, seven, uh, any of those, the mice die either during the embry embryonic development or uh, just at weaning. Uh, the, but you can do that in other, so if you do, if you use an inducible system, then you can do that when the mouse is an adult mouse. And if you do, somebody did whole body ATG7 deletion in an adult mouse, and that mouse dies of neurodegeneration. So the, the neurons cannot stand a prolonged autophagy blockage because they need it, they need to keep, to remain alive, basically. So in healthy cells, autophagy seems to be an oncosuppressive mechanism. So it prevents your cells from becoming a cancer cell. The problem comes in cancer cells. Now cancer cells also take advantage of autophagy. So now when the tumor is in place, autophagy is good for cancer cells and can be good or bad for the immune system. And, and that is like where all the complication comes off. And also because when you are in the tumor microenvironment, there's not just cancer cells, there's endothelial cells, immune cells, uh, fibroblasts, and for instance, the, your immune cells also will need autophagy to fight cancer. And that, so that's why these systemic approaches, these non-targeted approaches tend to fail because you're taking away your own um, weapons against cancer.
which is your, your immune system, basically. And most of the immune cells, actually, dendritic cells need it, CD8 positive T cells need it, uh, CD4 positive T cells need it. So it's, it's very conserved mechanism, so conserved. And I failed to mention that yeast cells have a very, yeast cells don't have caspases, right? They might have a meta caspase that somebody tries to sell as a caspase, blah, blah, blah. We believe, we don't believe, it, I don't know. But yeast cells have all the genes for autophagy. So autophagy, came in evolution before caspers depend on this cell, cell dismantling. Thank you so much. Sure. Lorenzo is... Ah, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you you want to ask a question? Actually, Lorenzo kind of answered on the go, but uh, <laughs> I can complement with uh, one part that I was just thinking about. But taking Caspes out of the question and therefore apoptosis, have you seen anything related to Partanatos, Lorenzo, in, in, in this type of response? Because thinking on a way to, to have the, the mitochondrial membrane permeabilization, uh, disregarding all the, the apoptotic machinery, uh, I, I just thought about it, but uh we 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 generated some uh, at the very beginning when i arrived i thought i would have more bandwidth than i actually got and so at the very beginning we generated all these tsa cells but that those are the cells we used you know in those experiments right we have them in all the possible flavors you would want we have mlk knockout parpua knockout uh you know gas derm so we have anything that was under the sun and we generate a good panel that now from time to time we pick some up and we do some tests uh, we, I wanted to go down that way, right? Um, what, tells, what tells me that at least partially mitochondrial apoptosis is, is involved is the data we have when we do backs back knockout. So when we do backs back knockout, which are supposed to be not related in partanatos activation, we do see a very strong reduction, at least in the cytokine secretion. Um, in, we in we never did... Oh, sorry, but in the PARP knockout, you didn't see the, the same effect? No, we, we, did, we didn't even test them. We just stored them. Oh. We just generated the cells and then um, for future use and nobody got them to, to, to store them since. <laughs> I've got it. Thank you. <laughs> Lorenzo, uh, if we move a little bit from cancer to the infection, so you have a site of infection, and then you do have some dead cell death that uh, then would drain, you know, the cytokines or contents or debris to the lymph nodes. So do you think also this play with autophagy may uh, increase somehow the the immune response against the infection and uh, putting this in the context of vaccines. So we have a lot of uh, vector vaccines or live vector vaccines. So what do you think about? Uh, I think that uh, in, there's a time component there that speaks a little bit also uh, to the context of oncolytic viruses, right? I mean, autophagy, one of the original role of autophagy was fighting pathogen infection, right? So uh, there are many models in mice where if you do autophagy deficiency locally and you infect them, they are doing worse because they, they cannot control the initial steps, which is the cellular step. They cannot reduce, you know, viral propagation in the initial host before the immune system kicks in. So there is a autophagy, and there's an antiviral component of autophagy that comes before the immune system kicks in. And then there is what you could think about, which is maybe later inhibiting autophagy might maximize type 1 interferon secretion and then engage a better immune, immune response, right? And um, vi oncolytic viral therapy goes along those lines. So basically you don't want to have type 1 interferon secretion at the very beginning because otherwise your oncolytic virus will not work. So you, you want to you want your oncolytic viral to be happy for a while. And then later, when the immune response has kicked in, then you want to have type 1 interferon, et cetera, et cetera. And I think so differentiating between the cell intrinsic initial effects versus the, the long, the, the like immune component that might come a few days later or hours later. It is difficult to, to tell you a time, but you know, sometimes later um, is very important here. 
And I want to say something else uh, that now I miss. Um, so, so um, yeah, and, and in terms of of uh, of like evolution as well, like uh, type one interferon came around at the at the level of multicellular organism. Right? Autophagy was there to prevent pathogen infection in unicellular organism. So that's uh, and then I think the, and then all these mechanisms, including other mechanisms, the DNA damage response, the UPR. All of them evolved as a unicellular adaptive machinery. And then they acquired all these new functions to communicate to the rest of the organism that there's a problem, et cetera, et cetera. But this is coming later in evolution. And if you're interested in that, I, I suggest you to, there's a, a review I wrote in 2018, Nature Review, Molecular Cell Biology. We really discuss all that from the, the, the changes from unicellular to, to multicellular in the adaptation to stress. Sure. Sure, and uh, so, but you, do you know any any work, or if you would be in, kind of, in your opinion, it would be interesting to try to modulate the vaccine-induced, let's say, CD8 T cells by playing with autophagy activators and inhibitors in this, uh, you know, what do you think? Yeah, I think it would be. I think it would be a good strategy providing that you can do it in a in a um, targeted manner because what i would what i would what i would say is like um you if you want to do an immune response you probably don't you want to want want to have your virus to be at least a little active right in this uh in this uh, in this living virus scenario because that's why we have to, what you're talking about not too much because then you have a risk that an inactivated virus might become virulent again, because inactivated virus also play a game in a wild type of scenario. So we are so yes. that. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, I say, so if, if you're talking about things that for sure will not give you an infection, so like a component based vaccine or RNA based vaccine, in that case, autophagy inhibition, as long as you can target it to the cells that are producing the antigen at the very beginning, it's good. Because then the dendritic cells will need autophagy and CD8 T cells will need autophagy. Yeah, no, we have uh, in the lab a couple of projects with uh, recombinant uh, attenuated listeria uh, huh. vaccine. And uh, I was just thinking that maybe, you know, inhibiting in the short term autophagy and then maybe later on inducing, you could get a more robust uh response and we use a mice mouse model which uh, clear up the the infection anyway so it's not uh, like something very dangerous for the mice but it's one of the possibility is that uh, the clearance of infection you observe with the uh, inactivated well the, the you know debilitated listeria is dependent on autophagy so you might end up in a situation where if you inhibit autophagy the mouse is no longer clearing the infection and succumbing to listeria, so there is and there is work out there uh, in other scenario where the inhibition of autophagy was associated with increased sensitivity to different, for instance, viral loads, right? And you know how they do it in the viral setting; they they put ten to the ten, ten to the nine, ten to eight, and they 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 get to a point where they kill the, the mouse. So I don't know, maybe completely not, but it's a possibility that you might encounter. Yeah, I, I was thinking of doing that in a regulated way. So just uh, temporarily inhibit and then release and see what happens. Yeah, it's surely it's it's interesting approach. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Lorenzo, a quick question. Um, do you see any regulation of the checkpoint inhibitors or checkpoint markers? Um, in terms of exhaustion of your uh, cells or appearance of PD1 or PDL1, this kind of uh, interaction there with the tumor it, and uh, the T cells. Yeah, we do. I mean, especially in the in the breast setting, if you don't clear the disease, then we we get lots of exhaustion, and that's and I, I think it it reflects the our inability to generate such a strong immune response up front. Like there's a, um, there's even some literature we. We have a sense, we had a sense of that. There's other papers we did it in a much more refined and, and actually more elegant way, um, suggesting that 
these type of interferon responses are very good if they are acute and powerful and resulting. So you get the response, you get the T cells on board, you kill the tumor, then you go away. If you cannot do that, it becomes chronic, subdolent, low, low degree, then it's a mess because then you have uh, TPI, tumor promoting inflammation, or all the T cells that get in there are exhausted by definition. They, don't, they are continuously exposed to antigens that they are unable to clear. So I think it's really important, even when we time strategies to potentially move to the clinic that we think about, okay, let's do it strongly and then stop it. We don't want to have this continuous cytokine production to a microenvironment. Lorenzo, yeah, just, I think I'm just stressing more the, this uh, infection thing. So what about combining uh, radiation or chemotherapy, whatever, with the intratumoral injection of uh, BCG, let's say. So, uh, some, you know, just to really boost, uh, what, what do you think? Well, we did it with oncolytic peptides. We didn't right. do it with, uh, and, and that, that, those are very powerful because they induce a massive release of damps. Um, so, and then, yeah, you get, a, you get a better control of the disease, both locally and systemic. I think we published that uh, in Ocumenology a few years ago as a strategy. And there's been a lot of strategies locally um, with radiation. I think that one of the major problems with radiation is that in many settings, local control is good enough. They just, you know, they, they, do, they, they do dose escalation, they have stereotactic. So in many cases, they have a very good local control but they are unable to build on a response that might prevent metastatic you know, exit from dormancy, for instance, in the breast. Uh, so that's, that's the problem. And, and going with these immunostimulatory strategies is the way to go. We, we all believe that. Unfortunately, um, I think they also might need the ref refinement of conventional dose instruction and, and, and fractionation because some of them are basically immunosuppressive per se. So it's difficult to build an immune response by combining radiation plus PD-1. If you, for instance, in the head and neck setting, you irradiate all the, the nodes, which is standard of care for that and neck. So in that case, you're basically prevent a priori that you will not get an immune response. I mean, you're taking away the site of initiation of immune response by irradiating it. So how do you think you can go back with a PD-1 and then get a better effect? Not happening. So I think there's a, there's a need for redefining Dose and fractionation in some settings, volumes, so targets. What do you irradiate? Can you not just irradiate the tumor, leave the lymph node in place for a while, then maybe come back later to the lymph nodes? And also sequencing. Uh, we rolled the dice as everybody in the clinic. There was PD-1, let's combine PD-1. We don't do preclinical modeling. We just you know, talk to AstraZeneca, they have billions. Oh, I want to combine PD-1 with my favorite chemo. And uh, how do you do it? Oh, I don't know, concomitant. Concomitant maybe is not working. I mean, and you probably should have tested it in a better way before going to patients. So th these are the three aspects that I think we need refinement. And for chemo is the same reasoning. I mean, maximum tolerated dose, when maximum tolerated dose gives you lymphopenia and, and myelosuppression, how do you want to get an immune response out of that? <laughs> Anybody has questions, any students? Otherwise I have one quick uh... So being you, the guy that, uh, uh, you know, put forward this nomenclature and guide uh, everything. So what do you think about panopitosis? <laughs> I, I think that uh, it's, it, we, need more, we, we need more results on that. <laughs> right. Before, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a complicated, I mean, there's lots of terms out there now, cuproptosis, alkaliptosis. Right. I think those are, most of them are just uh, specific instances of the cell death types that we have been seeing so far that people want to make a career out of. And, and uh, that's perfectly fine with me. But um, I think that the next round of nomenclature, um, we will be very careful in commenting on those. This year, we didn't even go for nomenclature. This year, we went for more of a broad overview and apoptosis. Um, but yeah, I think in a few years from now, when the field is progressed a little bit more, probably. We're going to come out and do the crazy nomenclature thing again. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lorenzo. Lorenzo, super thanks. Thank you. Again. Super thanks. We need to do it again. It's incredible, this uh, immunity.
immunogenic versus non-immunogenic. Uh, so that so, I think it's yes. still it's still gonna rule a lot of the cancer, you know, biology and. And now there's a lot of interest, both from from um, academic centers and from farmers, of course. But now they, everybody wants to change the way cancer cells are dying. Uh, there's lots of investment there. Yeah. All right, man. Thank, thank you, man. Thank you very much. Thank yeah, you, thank you, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. guys.